emotional compartment. The other emotional compartment <coughs> emotion is human rights. And so you have the emotion for the environment, the emotion for the human rights of displaced persons, or the emotion associated with economic progress. These are emotions that are, have been compartmentalized, where no such compartments should ever exist. By keeping the concept of the harmony of all these emotions in the economic potential to improve the environment, improve the life of the displaced persons, and even more importantly, improve the productive power of society, those who are, are, are tending towards the environmental or human rights will who will normally oppose these uh, development because they are they are, have compartmentalized their emotions, you could overcome them. These are emotional components. This is an emotional component, an emotional unthinking component that does not think it act, it reacts by emotion. Another example of the emotional compartments deals with the politics of smear and scandal. The inability to judge the value of a leader because of some false or real decontextualized private uh, revelation. You, you, you now compartmentalize the individual between their public good that they might be doing and some aspect of their private life. This compartmentalization of, po of the positive emotion towards a, a good leader is challenged by the other compartment of alleged private life. That has been ubiquitous in the British system, in England, and uh, some of the great Irish Republican leaders were destroyed this way. Um, it, and also you have both Trump and, 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 and uh, both, uh, both Donald Trump and Bill Clinton have been besieged by this kind of thing. So, so, so this is another compartmentalism of emotions. How do you overcome this compartmentalization? where maybe something the person did in their private life, uh, like you saw with Judge Kavanaugh, is a good example, this, this total um, psychotic frenzy. How do you ever find out whether the person's any good or not? And you, you have to look at them as a whole. How do you do that? Uh, okay. Okay. Who, who among the population thinks about who's Who's going to benefit from the scandal? Or who created the scandal? Or why they did it? What was the intention? I think, okay. So how do we look at the whole person and their contribution rather than something personally scandalous? Okay. So more issues of compartmentalization of emotions. All issues of prejudice are emotional compartments. All issues of tribal, caste, or even class loyalties are emotional compartments. This includes race, gender, ethnicity, etc. And this is most emphatically applies above all to religion. Uh, this also includes today's identity politics. Emotions associated with identities which divide people are powerful emotions, but they don't, there's no unity. There's a very hard, it's very hard to get the unity, the, the conception above that. Now, the religious compartmentalization of different theologies with different, uh, however, these different theologies nonetheless tend to express some fundamental principles or deities. However, their differences are used to introduce antagonisms as a governing conflict structure. Early on, in the early 1400s, middle 1400s, this led the great Cardinal uh, Nicholas of Cusa in, in his uh, uh, Pachi Fide to develop the concept of the unity of opposites. That there is a higher theological concept where these oppositions are united in a fundamental principle. Thus, to seek this higher principle between confessions so as to work to have the confessions cooperate for the common good, rather than go to war. This deeper principle of the common good is not confused, must not be confused with toleration. And Robbie had a whole, uh, had a whole 
I guess you could say, mini conference on this uh, some time ago, which, which is still relevant in our situation. Now, then there's a whole other class of compartments in political philosophy over how to govern, which has been uh, created. Uh, one example of this, it didn't exist so much in the past, but it exists now, uh, especially in the 20th century, is the right to left spectrum, or the left to right spectrum. Another example is capitalism versus socialism. This often takes the form of, you get to choose, critical choices. So you get to choose which compartment you want to be in. Then there is the geopolitical compartments of us versus them that has kept the world divided so that uh, the economic looting of the world can continue under, under a new form of colonialism. Then there are the newer compartments coming out of uh, Freud and modern psychiatry. You choose your sexual preferences, leading to a further fracturing uh, uh, compartmentalization of human identity. So how do you bring all these different human identities, sexual identities, together around a concept of, of unity? You know, since how do you, since I am a woman and I, 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 I have no, I have no unity with you as a man, and vice versa, and then it breaks down even further than that. So this is the empire. This is compartmentalization. This is the empire. So how do you break down the compartments? Well, the, one of the best examples is the Belt and Road, the LaRouche policy that China has adopted. You have a unified conception of getting the world out of poverty, and she calls LaRouche's Belt and Road the shared destiny of the future, the shared destiny of all these relevant compartments. In the shared destiny, all these relative compartments with respect to uh, uh, religion, ethnicity, uh, uh, geopolitics, economics, all these compartments start to, to disintegrate. The, the empire is these compartments in the mind. Breaking them through a higher general good conception or a unity is the essence of all organizing. It's the essence of all organizing. Now we come to the nastiest compartments of them all, which, which in part Stu, Stu alluded to, the experts compartment. Uh, but, this, but this is in a much more negative way. This example is very disturbing. Patrick Moore, the former founder of Greenpeace, I should read it, but I'll, I'll paraphrase it. I should have had it out the former founder of Greenpeace, in an interview with Sputnik, which you can read, was asked about the Green New Deal. And what he basically said, and I'll paraphrase, is that if they carry it through on a global scale, it would reduce energy production by 80%. And the consequence of that was that you would end up reducing the world's population by 80%. That people in the cities don't understand how much energy is required to produce the food, transport the food, what kind of infrastructure is required, all of the infrastructure that's required which, create, which, which, which creates energy. You breathe the air, you don't, that doesn't cost, that doesn't take any energy. And, and other things you might think don't take a lot of energy, but if you want to eat, it, it, it takes a lot of energy. And, and, and so, uh, and, so, now, something very interesting happened last week, which is relevant to this. It's, relative, uh, it's relevant to what Stu said, and it's relative, relevant to what I said, or what I said. And you'll get the gist of it in a second. The Washington Post published a leak about the Trump administration's preparations for announcing the formation of a commission or, or climate panel under the National Security Council to examine this whole issue in the symposium form, in, in effect, bringing everybody together and having it out in the open to discuss what's real and what's not, you know. That's what he's, that's what, essentially, 
it, I mean, it may not be exactly that, but that's essentially the idea. And before even the Trump administration has announced this, it was leaked. And even before that, 58 leading retired flag officers and defense-related analysts. This is not scientists. This is military people and defense people have sent an open letter to Trump backed up by former Senator Chuck Hagel, who was a very big senator at one time, and former uh, Secretary of State and Presidential candidate John Kerry to denounce the climate change panel proposal, demand that it not be created. Before it's even announced, they're demanding that this panel not be created. Why? Why? Because it's going to threaten the compartments. Right? Because otherwise, it's I say this, you say that, and he says that, and she says that, and you know, you know, etc. Then on Paul Greeson's blog, it's called Eco Imperialism: Green Power, Black Death. It's, it's the name of the blog. I love it. Eco Imperialism: Green Power, Black Death. Huh? Who is it again? Paul Greeson. Um, I mean, not Greeson. Greeson. He has a blog, blog. He actually had an article. He actually had a piece in our in our uh, in our environmental pamphlet. Okay. And um, and there's an article, not written by him, but there's an article on his blog that estimates. What they, what what they call the eco-industrial complex. The eco-industrial complex is two trillion dollars. That's all the subsidies. That's all the, the renewable energies. That's all of the economic economy of climate change and and renewables and solar and wind and 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 uh, uh, ethanol and all of that. It's a whole economy, and the military side of it, the uh, on a global scale, two trillion dollars. And this is all. This is all. Um, uh, lower energy flux density technologies, all the taxes on carbon as well, and etc. The grants, everything. All the vested interests that have grown up in the last 30, 40 years. So we have an entire equivalent to the military industrial complex, which is can be called the eco-imperialist industrial complex or the eco-industrial uh, complex. So we have two, we have two of them that are now a problem. Not just one. Actually three. And and uh, they are all draining the resources that could be used for, for, for development that would increase the productive power of labor. Or should we better use the word a form of looting? So now we have also the third complex. We have three complexes of this kind of magnitude. The biggest is the military industrial complex. Then comes the eco imperial industrial complex. And something that we would call the drug financial complex, which is also in the same order of trillions. So this gives you a, a sense of, of what we're up against. These all exist because people are in compartments and these three complexes are outside those compartments. And you cannot fight these three complexes from within the compartments. You have to go outside the compartments. You have to organize a global conspiracy to crush them, which is what the Lula Rouge movement has always been trying to do. We never operated within the compartments. We never said, well, we'll get somebody elected and then maybe they'll do something. Never. You cannot fight this at the local level. You have to organize an international conspiracy, which is how we've always operated. Discompartmentalized mental constructs are the real empire which we 
and the Belt and Road are demolishing. You cannot do anything about anything within the compartments. Nations can do nothing within any of these compartments. They have to work with other nations to change and crush the compartments. Now, here, this brings me to the most sinister situation of all, which is referenced earlier by Patrick Moore interview, but also implied in what Stu had to say. How is it that so many people can't connect to the fact that what they are supporting in the Green New Deal is the very death of those most active in supporting the Green New Deal, the city dwellers. The, the city dwellers will be the first to die. Why? Because those in the rural areas have a better chance of survival. So the very people who are opposing the Green New Deal are the ones who have the greatest chance of survival. The very people who are organizing for the Green New Deal are the first that are going to die. Why are they doing that? This gets at the core of the situation with these politicians. Despite the vested interests involved, don't they know this? Don't these politicians who give lip service to this know this? No. I don't think they do. Why? The reason being is that the politician is in the political compartment. Not the expert compartment. If you go outside your compartment, you are not credible. You will be punished. So politicians have their compartment. It has no relationship to reality. It has only relationship to power and other re related media and, 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 and how you talk and you know who you who you work with and all of that. Right? But Trump wasn't part of that. You have to keep that in mind. So that's the political compartment. So to them, it's not their department whether the policy they're promoting is going to kill 80% of the population. It's just not their department. It's just not, you know, it's just not their department. Anyone who asserts that they know anything outside of their compartment is not credible. This is exactly what Stu was saying on, 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 the, on the silos. You cannot go outside your compartment. In other words, what's the difference between people in their compartments and the medieval peasants who never leave the land and live in a small world? What's the difference? This also applies to information. All information gets compartmentalized unless there are underlying principles to organize the information. This compartmentalization is the death of science. LaRouche always operated from the standpoint of a principle governing reality, not compartments. Instead of science, we have pseudoscience. This proposed commission by Trump is an attempt to confront us in whatever primitive way they're trying to do it. And this is huge. This is huge. And it's going to be a brutal fight over whether this is even going to take place. Okay. On the deeper level, this is where Stu was talking about, the law of entropy, or the second law of thermodynamics, is the basic law of all physics governing the laws of the universe. It is also the top law governing today's pseudoscience hegemony, including especially the Green Movement. No physicist will have a standing if they challenge this universal law. They might get away with saying, I'm not sure, like a friend of ours. <laughs> but they're not going to get away with challenging it. According to the narrative, by an almost infinite by, according to the narrative, by an almost infinity of improbability, in opposition to entropy, life emerged on our planet. Further in the narrative, the consequence of this is that the universal rate of entropy is increasing toward heat death because of that development. 
In other words, if you have something going against entropy, it is, it is, it is increasing the rate of entropy. And the law of evolution within life is similar. Material select, natural selection, or random in the modern form of is random mutations, naturally selected, is what governs um, is what governs uh, evolution. And any biologist who challenges that gets the same treatment. Then comes the second degree of almost infinite degree of improbability within life. The emergence of humans. This is followed by the third almost infinite improbability, the emergence from humans of science and civilization. All of which is alleged to be nothing but the speeding up of the universal march towards heat then. This is supposed to be irrefutable science. <laughs> to replace the universal law of entropy with the universal law of potential. Nothing is what you see. It is what it has the potential to become as a whole. Or better, what is it becoming? There are no fixed particles. Only the unfolding symphony which one can know through science but cannot know through our senses directly. We can only see the, the present properly if we work back from the future. All states are potential to a, uh, to a future development state in terms of creativity. So, so this is a very different idea, but what if, you assume, what if you adopted that instead of entropy? What would that do? In climate change, pseudoscience, a similar a pseudoscience, by the way, their, their climate change is a pseudoscience. A similar situation holds. They have what they call the standard model, which uh, um, Charles Grassi kind of tried to develop for us. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't get all the parameters and everything of standard model, but I have the basic idea that the standard model is one of fixed variables and there's one variable that is increasing, which is human production of CO2. And since you assume that there is an equilibrium and that this is the disequilibrium in, introduction of this equilibrium into the standard model, you assume that that's what's called, going to cause the changes. But then, since it's not causing the changes necessarily, you have to invent the, 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 the data to go with that. But that doesn't mean, it means that if you agree with the standard model, you're, you're agreeing already to subscribe to a fixed system that is not predictive. It's not, it doesn't matter what's predictive. It's a question of whether you agree with it. It's whether, we, whether you, and then all, all academic climate change people who uh, have to agree with the standard model. And then when, when the non-standard model people say something, what they say is, oh, that's not, that's not in the standard model. No, that's not in the standard model. You, you know, no, 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 you can't do that. We haven't established that that's in the, that's in the standard model. That's how they do it. Right? They set up the parameters and then, and then, then, okay. Now, there's two areas which the standard model doesn't, doesn't deal with, which are kind of important. One is the relationship of the sun's activity with the ocean, okay, which is not in the model, I don't think. And the second one is cloud formation, which they have no idea how that works. So there's two, very, two area, huge areas where the standard model is not, does not fully take into account. So, so this is how they, they do these things. They set up the structure of what is permissible within this compartment, the standard model. And if you go outside of it, you're not, you're not with the program. You're not pe properly peer reviewed. 
But there's a lot of people now attacking it. So, uh, so, so basically, that that's this is very pernicious. This is very pernicious, and this is species threatening. And <clears throat> again, this is the climate change model compartment. You are not a climate scientist unless you subscribe to the climate change model, uh, standard model. Again, this is how you compart uh, compartmentalize and define a pseudo-compartmentalization of science. However, because of India's rejection of the Paris Accord, uh, as, along with Trump's rejection of the Paris Accord, and other nations, including the Saudis' rejection of the, of the Paris Accord, and many other countries moving in this direction, including Russia and the Belt and Road, and the existence and existential nature of the New Green Deal, over the next two years, we could, uh, we could break this power of this British academic priesthood and the three such uh, uh, destructive economic complexes that I described, uh, kept intact by people being stuck in compartments and not, not looking at it. I mean, local law enforcement is allowed only to go after the local people who are very low level. They're not allowed to go after the higher-ups. That's what we mean by compartmentalization, and that ends up demoralizing all the local people, law enforcement people, because they know it. So, so this is, we are in a period of shattering the compartments, and our job is to continue shattering the compartments. The right-left compartment, the capitalist, social, socialist versus, uh, you know, uh, versus capitalist compartment. The economic ideology compartments. These are all being shattered. And with the shattering of these compartments, you also have more people starting to think. The geopolitical compartments are being shattered by what we're doing in the Belt and Road. In all of this, the U.S. most importantly, the Democrats have lost the working class. The people on whom the society's production depends. Now you have to understand, what I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm shifting into the political situation inside the U.S. from this standpoint. What the Democratic Party has, has had in the past was whatever they had on the periphery, women's rights, gay rights, and eco rights, whatever, they always had a centrist, centrism which fo ultimately focused in on labor, and on, on, on and on social security, and on uh, and on, on the uh, on the uh, the social net and the trade unions. That was the core of the Democratic Party, and has always been the core of the Democratic Party in the United States. I had a meeting on Thursday with a with a senior senior behind the scenes, 82 year old behind the scenes, um, uh, inside. We talked about the presidential election and the democratic strategy of the presidential election. And he said, we're doing identity politics. When the Democratic Party bases its entire presidential campaign and all the people running base their presidential campaign on identity politics, what do you mean by identity politics? Millennials is an identity category. Women is an identity category. Gays is an identical identity. Blacks is an identity. You know, Hispanics, these are all identity categories. They're not, unif there's no unification. You say, well, I'm for this, 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 and this, and you pull it all together, but there's nothing unifying. In the past, the unifying focus of the Democratic Party was economics, ultimately. And the battle that's been going on inside the Democratic Party over this question over the last several years has been whether the identity of the Democratic Party is going to be returned to, and this is the little rush battle that's been going on inside the Democratic Party for a long time, is whether they would return to that orientation. That was the whole battle around Obama and the mustache. That was the whole battle. It's for the 
identity of the Democratic Party. Well, from this discussion that I had with this very high-level insider, who has access to the national leadership as well as the state leadership, and who determined who the state de uh, Democratic Party chair is, I got to say, I got to, I got a sense that that's where the Democratic Party is going. And one of the things he said is that those people who represent that being able to pull people together around around this core, around the core of of the social net and labor and so forth, they're not running because the Democratic Party has abandoned the core. But what does that mean? That means they've handed it over to Donald Trump. That's what it means. They're not even going to compete with Donald Trump for the working class. This is, I just realize this now. I just started to realize what the significance of my conversation was with this person. And I'm going to write up a report for the organization as soon as I can. But what does this mean? This is going completely with the compartments and ending anything that goes across the compartments. And Trump, what is Trump doing? He's unifying around an economic orientation. He has, he has, he has been given the trade unions. He has been given the working man, the, the work, the work, working class. Okay. They're not even going to try to contest it. So what does this mean? This means that the Democratic Party is counting on turning out the women and the millennials. And they got this Alexandria Ocampo Cortez out there trying to be the Pied Piper to the millennials. And the millennials are not coherent. They might vote, they might not vote. You have no idea whether they're going to vote or not. But why would they want to vote anyhow? So this whole thing is crazy. So what does that mean? That means that the Democrats have already lost the 2020 election if Trump is still, in fu still functioning. So that means all the effort is now shifting from the election to the removal of Trump through a massive assault from the Congress and the seven committees that have oversight jurisdiction over remotely possible elements of what Trump is involved in. Okay. So that's what's going to happen. Now what does this mean? This means there will be subpoena after subpoena after subpoena after subpoena for the next, all the way up to the election. It means indictments of his family. It means, because they, they can't indict him, he's, he's a president. Indictments of his close associates, indictments of his families, more scandal and more scandal and more scandal and more scandal. Now, as Trump, so I said to my, I said to my friend, this 82-year-old insider, I said to him, when he said to me, you know, that, what is Trump going to do when he started indicting his children? I said to him, he's going to fight back. And he says, yeah, I know. And so what is Trump going to do? Well, he's already pushing to get the 